Thank you, thank you. So, um, our last presentation is by Amy, and I found Amy um, because I looked at a bunch of Electron apps, and I really wanted to find like a little, extremely well done, you know, just like high quality Electron app, and wanted to find the person who built it. And I looked at a few of them, and I found Pretzel, um, which I think doesn't have millions of users, but it's extremely well done. It's like just this cute little app that gives you um, all the shortcuts for the running application. It's a little menu bar app, and it's exactly the type of thing that just makes people's lives a little bit better. And I really, really appreciated that. Um, and, uh, you know, before we even get started, I just want to, like, applaud Amy because she came all the way here from Taipei, which I think is, like, super fucking far. Um, <laughs> if we're just being, like, entirely honest about it. Uh, so uh, I really appreciate that she's battling the jet lag here. Um, and please join me in welcoming Amy. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, uh, my name is Amy Chen. I'm a UI designer and a developer. I like to spend a lot of time making personal projects. So today I'm going to talk to you about Pretzel that Felix mentioned. Um, it's a small menu bar app. Just a little bit of background in case you have never used Pretzel before. Um, I always find myself having the same problems, like no matter designing or developing. It's, um, I could never remember the shortcut that I just learned a few days ago. Even though it's very easy to find the shortcut, um, but it's cumbersome. So. It involves a lot of steps. Usually you have to drop whatever you're doing, mm, designing, for example, um, and then Google the keywords, and then filter through a bunch of websites, and then find the legit ones, and that one probably has hundreds of shortcuts on it. Um, and then I, as a Mac user, I could never remember what those symbols mean. I swear I look it up so many times. So I asked myself, is it possible to show the shortcuts of the current app that I'm using in just one step? And that is why I built Pretzel. Pretzel is a contextual shortcut app. It works like this. So Say you are in Adobe Illustrator, and you are wondering about what's the shortcut for um, grouping layers. Um, with Pretzel, all you need to do is just go to menu bar, click Pretzel, it will show you all the shortcuts right there, automatically. And it has a quick search so that you can find um, the one that you're looking for. Also, uh, the symbols that I mentioned, it's, def it's spelled out now um, in control and command. Uh, since I released Pretzel, it got 20,000 downloads, and it became a product of the day on Prada Hunt. Um, I guess a lot of people were having the same issue as I had. So today, I'm going to talk to you about um, a few things that I learned from making this project. Start with how I st store data in Pretzel and how I use Koga frameworks in Electron and how I learned to distribute the app outside the Mac store and how I design differently for desktop apps using web technologies. And lastly, how I manage a small, small open source project. <laughs> Not a big one. Uh, disclaimer, um, I'm still working on the Windows release here, so all the examples today are going to be Mac focused. All right, let's talk about storing data. Um, like most of the project, um, I had to decide how I want to store data very early on. Start from um, the simplest version, uh, 
a simple solution on the left to the most complicated on the right. There are many storage options for electron, and these are the common ones that I found that people use. Um, so we have flat files, are uh, simply like text file, CSV, YAML, and then we have uh, local storage, like in browser solution, like local storage and index DB. Local storage is very easy to work with. It's simply a get and set kind of API, um, but you can only store it in streams. Index DB, I believe, is quite complicated to work with. I personally have never done it. Um, I know a lot of people wrap it with uh, Dexy.js. And then you have embedded um, database like SQLite and PouchDB and Love Field by Google. Um, if you need to store data that is not just streams, you probably want to use SQLite. Um, I didn't find a lot of examples that use MySQL and Postgres, like most of the web apps out there, like, you know, we always up for it. Um, because I think it's complicated to use a de desktop application with MySQL. So in order for myself to pick one out of these, um, I have to think about what kind of data I am going to store for Pretzel. So Pretzel has two different data types. Um, they have, uh, we have keyboard shortcuts and then user configs. Keyboard shortcuts, I want it to be human readable and very easy to uh, edit it. Um, uh, if a designer or say a copywriter want to add their shortcut, change the shortcuts, they don't need to learn how to code to do this. Um, on the other hand, the configs, it's like theme color, font size, that kind of simple things, not very sensitive. So neither of them are huge and sensitive and they're just simple. So that's why I end up choosing a flat file. Also, um, I saved these two in two different places. For keyboard shortcuts, I save it with the app because I think Whenever user pull down the latest of Pretzel, they need to get the latest shortcuts. Makes sense. But for uh, user config, I need it to be persistent, so I had to save it outside the app. Whenever user pull the latest of Pretzel, their theme color, their font size won't change. Um, there's an Electron module called uh, Electron Settings that allow you to save it to the user data directory on user's computer. So quickly summarize it. Um, since Electron is just Chromium at heart, so we should probably, probably use a lot of uh, in-browser solutions such as local storage or um, uh, index DB. But for Pretzel, I think flat files also make sense because I don't, I need it to be human readable and easily accessible. All right, second. Um, let's talk about how I use Cocoa Frameworks in uh, Electron. It's easier than it seems because, um, you know, all I have been working with is uh, JavaScript, so. It seems scary at first. Remember, at first, I say I want to find the current app. Um, in order to do that, I need to find out what in OSX knows that. So um, I don't know if there's any iOS developer here, but I'm going to just pardon me. I'm going to talk about. Briefly, five layers of uh, uh, OSX has. So you have Cocoa layer and media layer, core services layer, and core OS and kernel. 
usually people just work with cocoa layer and media layer. I think cocoa layers are like the flashy parts that you see on the screens, um, like buttons and forms, windows, anything you can see. So you can think of it as a library that has a huge amount of objects with predefined behavior. For example, a button, if you click it, it knows that, hey, I got you know, clicked. Uh, if I'm a form, uh, it knows how to receive the input. Inside of Coke layer, there are three main frameworks. That is AppKit, Foundation, and Core Data. AppKit, deal, uh, AppKit is used to uh, create a GUI, graphic interface. And then inside of App AppKit, actually there is a class that I was looking for, which is NS Workspace. What NS Workspace does is it launch an app and then look into the app cache. If there's cache, then it will load it and open it, open your app. And I think every single application has one NS Workspace. In NS Workspace, it has a utility function that you can get into the shared workspace. In shared workspace, you can, f because you know you have every single app has NS Workspace. Um, among the umbrella of shared workspace, you can find what is the frontmost application of all. To summarize what I just described in Swift, it kind of looked like this. And that's workspace, that shared workspace, that's the utility function I mentioned. And then um, in there, you can find the frontmost application and get, give me the name. So now um, we know how to write it in Swift. So let's see how to write it in uh, Electron. As far as I know, I think there are two NPM modules that will help with this. Um, one is called Node Object C, and the other one is Objective C. They both like expose Objective Runtime to Node developers, so you can just you can just write Cocoa application with Node. A lot of people use Node Objective C, but I choose the bottom one by Lucas Comer. It's kind of new, it's not a very popular project, but I find he's really actively working on it and the documentation is great. So to turn the Swift code into, um, you know, uh, in JavaScript using Objective-C module, first you have to import the correct framework, which is AppKit in my case. And then find uh, import the correct module, which is NS Workspace. Then you have all the properties functions available to use. Um, as you can see, share workspace from dot from most application dot localized name. It looks just like a JavaScript one, a uh, Swift one. So throughout the process that I learned, you know, there are bridges exist. Um, that you can use to uh, vote for uh, to to write Coco in Electron, and also this task seems kind of daunting to me at first because I don't know how to read Objective C and I briefly know how to read Swift, um, but since I uh, try to stick with the problems that I have in hand, which is how do I find the current application that I'm using. It seems a lot more manageable that way, instead of just sit down and read the whole Apple developer documentation back to back. All right, um, let's talk about distributing the app outside of Mac Store. When I um, finished my app, I was very excited. Um, and then quickly, I found out, like, wait, what? How, how do I get my app to m my user's computer? 
um, as a web developer, I never need to deal with that or even think about that. Usually, we just package everything, put it up on AWS, and then you know, point the domains to the right place and call it done. Um, but it seemed to have a total different process for desktop application. The f first time that in you install your Electron app on your friend's computer, you're likely going to see this dialog. It says, new app, while well, your app can't be open because it is from an unidentified developer, which means the app is not signed. Unsigned app, meaning the, it doesn't have a valid code signature. And code signature is like a security measure to make sure that your code has not been altered or corrupted bef uh, since it's been signed. So for example, if um, say someone put some malicious code into your signed app, that will change the hash in your app, and break the code signature. So when your user is trying to install the app, they won't be able to install it because they will see the dialogue saying like, hey, it's, um, it, uh, it's an unidentified developer. I think both Mac and Windows, they don't allow uh, you to distribute an unsigned app in their Mac store, uh, in their app store. So it's really important to sign your app. Um, it's very hairy um, to find out how to do this. It, I spend a lot of time Googling and reading documentation. But eventually I figure out this is just six steps. First, you, <laughs> you, get, you get the Apple developer program, which is $99 a year. Then you make sure you have Xcode installed on your computer, run it at least once. Then open your Keychain Access app on your Mac, and then uh, submit a CSR, a certificate signing request. So what it does is it, um, it will generate a private key store in your Mac and then send the CSR to, uh, to Apple. And then Apple will take that CSR and then when you go there and then create a certificate for your app, it will create a public key based on the private key on your computer. You have to download these certificates into your Keychain Access app as well. From the same place where Member Center is, um, after you've done the first four steps, you have to create your app bundle ID, which is usually in the reverse uh, domain name order. So like com.amychan.pretzel. Now with everything done, then you can run you can package your app, um, sign your app with these package. Um, I use Electron Packager instead of Electron Forge, uh, but you can use both. Uh, you can use either one. So if you've done everything correctly, you should see all the certificates download in your Keychain Access app. And then in the terminal, you should be able to run the command to package your app and sign it. I'll blow up the, the, the command here. So um, give it a, uh, your app name, which is Pretzel in this case. And then make sure you specify the platform and architecture you are, you are building this package to, which is Mac. And then decide if you want to archive your code or not. Uh, we will talk about that shortly. And then give it the path to the icon of the, um, this build that you need. Because every single platform uses different kind of icon format. For Mac, it's .icns. And then make sure you give it a flag saying, hey, I do want to code signing 
characters from OS X. If you have ever like packaged an Electron app, you probably have seen a SAR. A SAR is like a utility uh, uh, archive utility um, for Electron. If you um, if you uh, package a, if you build an app with a SAR, then user won't be able to inspect and see what's inside of your app. But if you do it without a SAR, then everyone can see um, what's inside of my app, what's the code, what's my CSS like, what's my crappy JS is like. <laughs> so lesson learned here, make sure you sign your app. And uh, co-signing certificates and provisioning we didn't talk about, but if you need to distribute I, I, in the future, I think you do have to. Um, it, they are all really important things to learn, and so I would highly recommend to spend some time, learn them, and then it will be very helpful for the future apps that you make, whether it's with Swift or with Electron. All right, let's talk about uh, how I design differently for desktop apps with web. Um, Electron, in general, is just a browser, right? Nothing look more like a browser than a white background and a loading in the center. So in order to take out that browserness out of it, I usually would give it a color. Or what's even better is I don't show the window until the data is ready. What's common in web apps is you have a lot of navigation. You have a lot of pages. But that is actually one of the most disorienting experience for desktop application. Um, because user will wonder like where did I put the, uh, the th where did I put the things that I just key in where did it go um, did I save it they were just it, it's confusing to them so you will notice that desktop apps they don't have a lot of pages instead they utilize a lot of toolbars and pings and sometimes overlays. Also, uh, in terms of typography, in web apps, we tend to like to uh, use custom fonts to give it some personality. But for desktop apps, I would highly recommend to stick with um, just system fonts. Because it, that way, your app will look more consistent with other desktop application and will not look kind of out of place. For Mac, the system font is San Francisco. For Windows, it's Seagull UI. And for Linux, I personally would recommend the Google Fonts Titanium. But if you are going to support Ubuntu, definitely use Ubuntu. In order to use, uh, to default to system fonts uh, per platform, you can fake it with CSS by setting the font equals to caption. And make sure that you turn on the anti-alias so that the fonts look sharp. Uh, and a side note is, um, since a lot of desktop apps are utility focused, so there's a lot of information, I would really try to avoid center aligned text because it's really hard to read information that way. Text align left or left and right is usually the way to go, I think. And, and a quick thing, um, you will probably notice that desktop applications interface text, say for example in uh, Sketch, you won't be able to select them, like your mouse won't be able to you know, double, select the text. In order to fake that with CSS, set, uh, set user select to be none. In general, so you have to support whatever existing paradigm 
um, for whatever, however many platforms that you're going to support. Say you're going to support Windows, then try to make your OK button on the left. If you're going also going to support uh, OS X, then try to make the OK button on the right, which means you probably need two different CSS um, for your Electron app. So the lesson learned here is that notice the behavioral difference between desktop application and web application. Just try to uh, um, stick with the desktop one so that it looks natural and trustworthy to your users. Lastly, let's talk about um, how I manage the um, open source project. Since I put my code on GitHub, I noticed that um, I had to spend a lot of time dealing with a lot of admin things. Mainly, they are dealing with issues and then organizing feature requests and a lot of miscellaneous things like you know, planning for release and updating documentation and so on. Um, so, it's really frustrating sometimes to see um, a lot of issues coming in in a day. You're like, ah, I'm the shadiest person. Um, but um, the way I deal with it is just read all the issues, just read all of them. Um, if an issue is actually a feature request, just tag it with feature request tag, and then, then you can close it. And <laughs> if uh, the issue is actually a question that you, you, you can find the answer in README, then you know, make sure the README has the answer and close it, right? So if an issue is actually an issue, then make sure it has all the steps that you can reproduce and then add it onto my to-do list and then try to solve it as quickly as poss possible. In general, I try to be responsive and active when I deal with issues because no one likes to see an issue sitting there months. That being said, I think I still have a couple. <laughs> um, and uh, the way I like to deal with organizing features requests is using a Kanban board. Um, after I collect all the feature requests from email, social media and just colleagues walking around telling me. Um, then I will put them onto a Kanban board um, and then just prioritize them, prioritize them based on the urgency and how many times it's been requested. And then share this roadmap to everyone. Um, it's, I find it very helpful to share your roadmap to everyone so that they are in the loop of what you're doing and when the feature that requested will be out. And a little more of like something more personal. Make sure you go in to this with a plan, even a vague one. So don't try to just merge every single pull request, it will quickly turn into a Frankenstein project. You just sometimes have to say no. And then, this one is a bit personal, I think, is no jade, just, which stands for justifying, arguing, defending, and explaining. This doesn't mean that you should um, uh, avoid people asking you question or avoid answering anything. It just means if there is any question, try to clarify. Try to clarify it once, just once and only. Don't repeat yourself. And then, be aware that you just can't make everyone happy. Um, making this kind of app, there's always people going to say like, "What's the point?" Like, this sucks. And especially if you make it with Electron, a lot of people are going to tell you, like, Electron is cancer. 
why why are you making your know, stupid app with this huge file? Anyway, so um, <laughs> as long as the project actually solve your own problem, so just be proud of yourself. You can't make everyone happy. Um, okay, so lesson I learned here is be open-minded and communicate in a concise and clear manner and really don't take things too personally. That's it. Um, so in general, I really enjoy working with Electron. Um, I find it documentation is great, super clear, and super easy to follow. And um, there's a very active community online. There's always people an asking questions and answering questions. It's just so helpful to uh, speed up your development time when you have things like that. If you really want to read more about Electron, I highly recommend uh, look into Awesome Electron, which is uh, a, a markdown file of all the cool Electron projects. And I would download the open source one and then just look into the code, see how they do it, and that's the fastest way to learn it. And Electron Fiddle is great uh, by Felix. It's great. It's, a, it's a, like a playground thing that you can uh, experiment little things with Electron with different, uh, different versions. And I like this Electron, the bad parts article. Um, it, the person I th the, that wrote it actually is a strong advocate of Electron, but he kind of mentioned the security issue, the performance issues that uh, I think Sam mentioned earlier. And then I will check out Electron blog, closely follow them for the security update. Um, it's, it's really helpful to know what's going on and why there are so many negative voices out there. All right, that sums up my talk. And if you want to find me, here's where you can find me. And let me know if you have any questions. Hey, any questions for Amy? Yeah, I'll come over. That was super cool. What are your plans for Windows, and what is the equivalent of the Objective-C library for Windows? Wait, say that again? What are your plans for the Windows version? Oh. Or how far, or what are your thoughts there? Make it work, I think. <laughs> That's it. Um, I don't know, first support Windows 10, and then go down from there. Um, I'm not a heavy Windows user, so there's definitely a lot of things I don't know that I need to deal with. <laughs> Does it support uh, browser apps like PWAs? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, I don't know much about PWA, but, um, yeah. Um, uh, so on Mac, do you support if somebody has overwritten a shortcut? Uh, because in macOS, if you have a menu and it shows you the shortcut, it'll actually reflect if you've overwritten it with something else. Have you found that API? No. OK. But I will look into that. That sounds really helpful. OK. Yeah. Actually, like, I think there is a, a way, by default on Mac, you can just command shift backslash, and it will go to the help menu. And then you can type in a bunch of uh, whatever you're looking for, and it will point you to the, the action that you're looking for. So you could use that instead of pretzel. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, one more time, give it up for Amy. Thank you. All right, so you technically made it through the day.
Um, there's just one thing left, except for like fixing this full screen right here. Um, there's just one thing left, which is that I need to like thank a ton of people, and I'm just going to force you to sit through this. I'm sorry, but you got to watch the credits. Uh, that's just the deal that we're going to do here. All right. Um, all right, let's just get started. So um, the first company I need to thank is Slack. Um, I know this looks a lot like this is actually a Slack event, but it's not. Um, this whole event came out of me talking to our events manager and basically asking for some help because I have no idea how to run an event. And uh, now we're here, and we probably wouldn't be otherwise because uh, I did not think of many things. Um, but you know, thanks to Slack, we're now here. Um, the second companies I need to thank are Microsoft. Microsoft sponsored the whole CI and user interface for um, what you can see on conveyanceconf.com, like the logo was made by Microsoft. And I also want to thank Exosoft over there, who, by the way, still have a ton of t-shirts. They're here from Arizona, and they really do not want to take them home. So if you need another tech shirt, please just go over there and take one. They would be really, really happy. They would really enjoy that. Um, but more importantly, they, they basically sponsored the marketing budget, as small as it was, for you know, this whole event. Um, and I can't thank them enough. And now we're going to go into the people section. So, sorry, I have like five slides. We, we will do this real quick. I need to thank Jen. I need to thank Goni, Tony. Tony, by the way, over there, turns 30 today and is still here, which I think is amazing. Um, I need to thank Tana Merla for the design. Uh, I need to thank the, you know, Matthew and Kyle, both in the AV production booth. Um, can we just get, by the way, they've been here like all day since like 7 a.m. Can we just get a quick applause for the AV guys? All right, then everyone who like took care of the speakers, Jeremy, Natish, Shiki, Trish, Sarah, and Vlad, thank you for taking care of our speakers. Then our three jumpers who like made sure that they probably took you upstairs, Charlie, Marcel, Matt. Um, then uh, everyone at Slack who like made sure that I didn't get fired over running this event. Um, <laughs> specifically Tony, Anna, Kate, Tomiko, Sean, and Deep D. Um, I also want to thank like the people who are responsible for ensuring that food is here, uh, Bonnie, Cassius, and Christina. Um, and then, of course, if you had a coffee today, our wonderful barista team, specifically Alicia, Kara, Eric, Matthew, and Mel. Um, and then, lastly, literally everyone who's a maintainer on Electron. I, I talked to so many of you over the last year to like put this on. Thank you for all your help. Everyone at Slack Desktop, um, I technically work at Slack, and uh, as you may have noticed, we've launched a new logo today. Um, so like me organizing also a conference today in the, the same building was a little bit of an inconvenience to everyone. Um, and nobody even complained. So uh, thanks for that. Um, of course, all the speakers. And then lastly, uh, you. Um, I don't know if any of you noticed that, but the uh, money you spend for the ticket, the, like, you know, depending on how much you paid, um, actually is all going to be donated wholesale to The Last Mile, an amazing organization that uh, basically teaches code to incarcerated people and prepares them for re-entry back into the you know, civilized world. And uh, we're going to give them almost, I think, pretty close to 10,000, uh, which is pretty amazing. And uh, that's money we're all donating to them. So thank you for coming. And uh, lastly, if any of you have any feedback about this conference, uh, I would actually like to hear it. Um, and ideally, I would like to hear it on Twitter. Just send me a DM or something. Like, tell me what went well, what didn't go well. Um, you're probably going to, I can preempt right now that I know that we need like about 20 more elevators. Um, all Slack employees know that. But Please do tell me how you felt about this whole event. And with that, um, I think people are still like, the barkeepers are still setting up, can't take much longer, and then I will just leave you all to drink and eat. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>